Church City Church. Can we put our hands together for Jesus? Come on, give him your best praise. High five your neighbor and say you're looking good today. You're looking good today. Yes, man. Everybody good? You awake? Shout amen if you're awake. Yeah. How many, how many of you, your football team won yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, first service, they erupted, man. It's like, yeah, yeah. And then I told them, I said, well, I hope you, heart, I hope you vocalize your, uh, your excitement for Jesus a lot, lot more than a, a football team. I, I made this decision a long time ago. I will not get more excited about a team that don't know me uh, 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 above a God that loves me and died for me. Amen. And so how many of you have been blessed by our series, Make Room? Yeah, yeah, four people, praise the Lord. Well, we did a good job at making room. We've shifted people around and provided child care for both services. And so now that we can grow and reach more people in our community. But today I want to talk about uh, worship, making room. And we're going to be looking into the life of David. Because how many of you realize David was a man after God's own heart? And, And let me just say this, David was not perfect. He had a lot of flaws and had a lot of mistakes. But he never abandoned his worship to God through it all. And so if you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We'll be in verses 12 through 15. When you're ready, say, go with it, pastor. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, they had sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might. I don't know what that looked like, but I'm sure it was a spectacle. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Come on, look at your neighbor this morning and tell him, make room for God's presence. Make room for God's presence. Can we talk about it for a little bit? Shout amen if we can. Yeah, I want to set up a little bit of context for what's going on in David's uh, moment in this passage. Chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, he had just been crowned king. And one of the first things that David does, unlike uh, Saul, is he puts a priority on God's presence. And Saul never got around to bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to the people of God. And David knows that his success and the people's success dictate, is dictated and determined by God's presence. And so David understands the importance and the priority of God's presence in his success. And so we'd see the Ark of the Covenant It is uh, the representation of and represents God's manifested presence in the Old Testament. Testament. Now we know that God is omnipresent, meaning that he is everywhere and every when. Come on, somebody. But there's a difference between omnipresent and manifest presence. And so the ark would have represented the manifest presence of God. Now in the New Testament, what does that look like for us? Well, we're in Christ. Now God's spirit does not dwell in tents or temples. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. How many of you realize that? And now we manifest God's presence with his people when we come together and we worship him and celebrate him, extend love and kindness. God's manifest presence is always in his people. And so we see that David's first attempt at bringing God's presence back to the people was not successful. A matter of fact, a man by the name of Uzzah, he, he died. Now, I don't know how he died. It could have been, how many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Come on, that's old people. That's an old move, 40 years old. Stop it. I'm dating myself. I don't know if his face melted off like the Nazis. I don't know, but he, he wound up dying. And so David shelved the, the ark and he stayed in and the ark stayed in Obed Edom's house. But David began to hear about the success of Obed Edom because how many of you know wherever God's presence is, God's blessing is? Yeah, and so David attempts to go and, uh, and retrieve the ark the first time. And it says in verse 3, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3, that he puts, he puts the ark on, somebody say, new cart. 
and brought it out of the house of Abinadi, and was, it was on a hill, and Uzziah, Ohio, and the sons of Abinadab drove the new cart out. And I mean, this seems like a good idea. Let's put, let's put God's presence on a new cart. At least it wasn't an old cart, but it was a new, a new cart. And the reality is, is that when it comes to like this new cart idea, it seems like a great idea because how many of you know the ark's heavy? It would have, it would have had some weight. And so to put it on, on the cart, to roll it to the people, that would have seemed like a, a good idea. Matter of fact, it probably would have been the people's preference. But when it comes to worship, let me, let me just say this. It's not about your preference. It's about God's preference. And so the, the, the cart would have been what was convenient for the people and it would have made it easier. But the truth is, is that when it comes to worship, let me just say this and say it nicely. It's not about your preference. It's about God's presence. And a lot of us, we can put so much emphasis on our preference when it comes to worship. What we want. We can, we can design the new cart because the cart's convenient. The cart is easier. The cart is what I prefer. The cart, and I'm saying that God never intended his presence to be carried by a cart. Whether it was new or old. God's presence was always designed to be carried by God's people. The Levites would carry the ark of God on poles. And a lot of times we can make worship about our preference, what, what we want. And how many of you know God has a, a love language? Come on, somebody. How, how, many, how many married folk we got in the house? Make some noise. All right. How many happily married folk do we have in the house? Yeah, that's good. That's better. You guys did good. But let me, let me just say this, is that guys, your, your love language, come on, could be different than your spouse. And a lot of times your love language and your wife's love language are completely different. Like my wife's love language is acts of service. Come on, my wife feels loved whenever I do dishes. Come on, there's one. <laughs> my wife feels valued and loved when I fold clothes. Come on, some of you ladies are like, man, that's what I'm talking about. My wife feels, feels valued and loved the way she receives love, like when I paint, painted the house. And you know, the reality is I don't, I don't feel like I don't feel that's not my love language. You know, I've never seen my wife doing dishes and went, ooh, man, I feel loved. I feel so valued and cherished. <laughs> like, oh, she's folding my clothes. I've never, I've never, like, I've never, I've never, like, felt loved if she's folding my clothes. Like, God, she loved, man. I get weak in the knees. <laughs> no, I, I never, I never, I never felt like that. You want me to feel love? Just tell me I'm, 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 a, I'm a bad dude. Like, look me in the eyes and say, you the man. Like, words of affirmation. Matter of fact, just, just go on and just rub my shoulders. Just touch, like, just touch me and just say, hey, you the man. You just, yeah, that's how I, I, I feel. That's how I feel love. My wife does not, that is not her love language. You know, I touch her and she's like, why don't you touch them dishes? <laughs> hey, man, hey, man. That's, she go ahead and touch the laundry right there. Boy, you bad, you bad. You can fold them like ain't nobody folding laundry like you. <laughs> but the truth is, is when, it, when it comes to God and when it comes to worship, how many of you realize God has a love language? And it's not about your, your preference. It's about his preference. And it's not about your preference. It's about his presence. And we can, we can make worship all about us, about the songs I like. I hope they play my, new, my song. I hope they play it. Well, I, it's okay that you like songs, but can I tell you, they're not for you. And we got to be real careful when it comes to worship, even worship, quote unquote, worship music. We can make it all about us. And it's all about him. Come on, somebody. Because God has a, he has a love language and we want to make it about us. And God's like, no, I have a preference. I have a love language. I have a way. I have a protocol. I have, I have a process. I have a way that you handle my manifest presence when you come together. And if we don't realize that, we can even start to worship worship. 
Like we make worship about about us. Now, let me say this. I'm not so dogmatic. There's two directions to the cross. We got vertical and horizontal. There's, we worship God. We exalt God. We edify God. We build God up. And there's some things that he's done for us. And so I get it. But if we're not careful, we can make worship all about our preference. And the reality is, is that Jesus in John chapter 4, he's talking to a woman at the well. And he says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will wor- worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Somebody say this and that. This is not this or that. Spirit and in truth. And I've been to some spirit churches. Come on, I've been to them, some spirit churches. And they have a holy hype session. I mean, they got, they got the spirit. I'm going to tell you that. They got the spirit. They just don't have biblical truth. Like, I've heard some things, and I'm like, oh, that's not really in your Bible. <laughs> like, that is, n- that is not, that's not truth. You got the Spirit, but how many of you know it's not this or that? It's this and that. And I've been to some true churches. I mean, they got solid theology, man. they got proper hermeneutics, they can make a Jeezy text. I mean, they're, they're good, but it, they, there is no Spirit. They're all true, like truth. They'll beat you in the head with truth. And there's no, there's no spirit. And it almost looks like there's something stank in the room. Ever been in one of those churches? You're like, I don't smell it. Babe, do you smell that? I don't smell it. And the truth is, is that God is looking for those to worship him in spirit and truth. Not this or that, but this and that. I want to be a this and that church. We want the spirit. We want the spirit and we want truth. Come on, we want, and some of you are here today and you might be like, well, you know, does it, does it really, does it take, does it take all that? Do I have to, do I have to be like emotional? And it's like, well, hold, hold up. Come on, Mark teaches us that Jesus said, love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Man, that's a holistic approach to expressing love but that's what worship is love expressed holistic everything i got all my heart all my mind all my strength come on all my might come on everything i got holding nothing back and some of us are like well do do i have do i have to to be emotional well you are emotional you're you're emotional you're an emotional being you might not be emotional when it comes to the things of God, but you are an emotional being. Let me just set up this context. You, you're emotional. If you were to check your bank account and there was nothing in it right now. Oh, 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 God. Come on. Some of you, when I asked if your team won, you were emotional. And the truth is, is you're an emotional being, but maybe you're here today and you're like, does it really, does it really take Does it take all that? Let me just pump the brakes. Remember, it's not about your preference. It's about God's preference. It's about God's love language. And in Psalms 98, this is what he has to say. Shout joyfully. I dare somebody to shout joyfully. Okay, some of you had to think too long. No, you're still debating whether it's right or wrong. So we're going to move on. Say move on. (laughs) Shout joyfully to the Lord all. Somebody say all. Are you on earth? Okay, some of you are still questioning that. Break, <laughs> break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. That's God's love language. Like, that's, that's not me. That's, that's him. Is there emotion involved? Well, if you, if you want to worship according to God's preference and his love language, and here's, here's the truth. It's a lot of us, we, we haven't moved beyond our preference to really honor God's presence because how many of you realize it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get uncomfortable at times. It's going to challenge you. It's going to stretch you. And the truth is, is that we are emotional. We're just not emotional about the things of God at times. And, and I get it. That there's, a, there's a process. And at the end of the day, when it comes to honoring God and worshiping God and handling God's presence, I don't want my preference 
Come on, I want God's preference because I want to honor his love language because here's the tendency is that we want to we want to we want to extend love the way that we receive love. And so if you're not an emotional being then then there's no emotion in your worship but God's love language is is shout, like let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let me just ask you this, when's the last time you just praised out loud? Said hallelujah. Come on, if you can't remember Come on, I want to challenge you because whatever challenges you has the power and the potential to change you. And it's not about your preference. Or how about this? Psalms 1, 150. It says, praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Come on. Praise him with loud. Somebody say loud. Did that really say loud cymbals? Praise him with clashing cymbals. Come on, and the drummer, the drummer's over there saying amen. That was him. Some of you are like, does, it, does this worship music have to be that loud? Well, n- not for your preference, but for God's. It says loud. I had a woman ask me one time, man, why is it so loud in here? Why is it so loud? I said, because heaven's a long ways away. I want them to hear us. <laughs> I don't think she came back. <laughs> I probably should have gave her the biblical answer, but I couldn't help myself. Y'all didn't pray for me. But no, God likes it loud. He likes it loud. Loud, crashing symbols. Crash those things, man. It's not, do, I, do I need it? No, nah, if it was up to me, we could do the silent disco. But it's not, it's not about me. Come on, when you get married, how many of you know it's not about you? Well, but if we're going to honor God and, and worship God, it's going to be a co- according to his preference. And David tried the whole new cart thing out of convenience and what he preferred. And it didn't end well for him. And why do, why do, why do we like it loud? Now, let, let me just say this. I know that I'm not going to be insensitive to the fact that we, we have some people that do have sound sensitivities. And our ushers, we want to try to seat you in the best place Uh, you know, that's going to minister to you. And so if you do have sound sensitivity, then that back corner over there is going to be your, that's going to be your place in space. If you like it loud, then up here, we're going to rock on with your bad self. That's where Jesus probably would be. Like he likes it loud or he'll be getting the drum cage right there. I like it. The, The end of the day, it's not about, it's not about your prayer. It's about God's love language, his, his preference. Or how, how about this? Maybe you're here today and, and you know, you're new to, to church or have just been coming. And let me just give you permission. I'm going to agree with you because um, this is how I felt, the whole, the whole hand thing. The whole hand thing. That's weird. Like, I don't care who you, I mean, I raised my hands, but when I first come, it was weird. When I seen it, it was like, they, they, have, they have a question. What's the question? Oh, they got two questions. Two questions. Didn't, I didn't understand the hand thing. It was kind of, it was odd. It was, it was weird. Why? Why do they, why do they raise, why do they raise their hand? I can worship God like this. What if I remind you again, it's not about your preference. It's about God's preference. In second Timothy, this is what he teaches through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The apostle Paul says he desires therefore that the men pray everywhere doing what? Lifting up holy hands. Now, let me just say this. It's not about the position of your hand. It's about the posture of your heart. And I raise my hands not because I have questions or I think that you think that it's weird. I don't care if you think that it's weird. I'm a surrendered vessel to God's preference and to his spirit and to what he wants. And if he desires holy hands lifted, let me stretch mine and surrender to his way and to his will and to his preference. I don't care if you think it's weird. It's not about you thinking it's weird. It's about me. Come on, surrendering to his will. Why, why, why do we... And so what what are you going to do with that? I hope that challenges you every time you get into the sanctuary that you know God's will and God's heart, that his heart is for you to raise holy hands. Come on, to a surrender. And it's not it's not about it's not about my hand position, it's about my heart posture. I'm a surrendered vessel. And if we're not careful, we can make we can make worship all about us, about my preference, oh, the new cart, the old cart. And God's presence was never intended to be carried by a cart, but intended to be manifested by by people. And he has a love language. 
But not only that, there's, there's a cadence to, to worship. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13, so it was when those bearing the ark, okay, so David, he has gotten it straight. Those, the people bearing the ark, the Levite priest, they're bearing the ark the, of the Lord. They had gone six paces and then he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. And so there is a rhythm, there's a cadence to worship. Come on, it was, it was walk, 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 worship. Come on, let me try it like this. Step, 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 worship. Step, 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 worship. Step, 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 worship. So what does that mean for us? That looks kind of weird, I know. Here, let me break it down. Let me break it down for you so you can understand the cadence and the rhythm of worship. It's work, 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 worship. Come on, it's the principle of the Sabbath. Work, 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 work. Come on, worship. And a lot of us, let me just say this, you could do more waiting with God than working without him. And we get so b -b 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 busy. We, you know, we wear busy like a badge. Like, hey, man, how you doing? I've done it. Maybe you've done it. We all do it. Say, like, hey, how you doing, man? I'm busy. I'm busy. And really what you're saying is I'm important. I'm important. I'm really somebody. I'm important. I'm important. And a lot of us, if the enemy can just get you busy to get you out of rhythm, because there, there's a cadence. And David, David under, understood that that he would walk. There's step, 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 step. There's the unforced rhythms of grace. And God has designed you and I to wait, to rest, to take a Sabbath. Come on, somebody. It is healthy because I know I can do more waiting with God than working without him. And some of you haven't figured that out yet. Come on. It is an act of surrender. It is an act of worship. There is a rhythm. Come, there is a rhythm, white men. There's a rhythm to worship. Come on, somebody. That's me. I can talk about us. <laughs> That's racist. No, I'm white. I can say it. Some of you feel weary today. Can I tell you what would help? Waiting. Waiting with God. Worshiping with him. Come on, Isaiah chapter 40. It says, come on, it says that those who, come on, you can get it. Wait. All right, because first service, they couldn't read. They didn't know what that said. <laughs> those who, what? They, they wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Some of you feel weary and I dare to say it would help if you learn how to wait. And I can declare that I can do more waiting with God than working without him. Come on, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Come on, there's a cadence. There's a rhythm. Not only is there a cadence when it comes to worship, there's also a cost. When he sacrificed oxen and sheep. Come on, there's, there's, a, there's a cost. And the reality is, is in the Old Testament, when it speaks of worship, there's always sacrifice. Sometimes in the New Testament, what does that mean for us? Well, sometimes we, we've got to let out a sacrifice of, of praise because you don't always feel like it. What's to sacrifice your flesh? Come on, you don't always feel like it when you come in the house. If you make a sacrifice... If I said praise, and so at the end of the day, it always, like worship, worship. Ready? Here it is. Say, go with it, Pastor. Worth-ship. Worth-ship. Value. Come on, somebody. A lot of us, when it comes to giving, let me just say this. It's not necessarily a cost or a monetary issue, although it could be. I'm not ignorant to that. I think it's a worship issue. It's a value issue. Because there's a cost. There was a sacrifice. Come on, we worship Christ 
He's the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life for you and I on the cross called Calvary. And there's always a cost. And when we honor and we worship God in our giving, come on, let me just say this. He's worth worship. And the reality is, is if you don't understand worship, you can be critical towards somebody's worship in this area. Don't believe me? You should read John chapter 12 when the disciples criticize. Come on, they criticize Mary for pouring out a very costly anointing oil called Spikner, top shelf. Hey, man, this could have been sold for the poor. And the reality is, is that people that don't understand this segment of worship, they look at it as a waste. And can I tell you, Mary didn't waste that anointing oil. She worshiped the Lord with it because she understood worth-ship. Because you look at John chapter 11 and it makes sense because in John chapter 11, her brother was dead for four days. And when Jesus showed up on the scene with the Jesus lean and called him right out of that tomb, come on, he did something that no, no one but God could do. And so in her response to doing the thing that only God could do to raising dead things to life, come on, and you may be sitting here today, and let me just say this, if you're in Christ, he's rose a dead thing to life, but you don't see the worth. <laughs> so you don't worship in this area. There's always a cost. It's always a cost. Even David, when he bought the threshing floor, he bought it to, to worship the Lord, to build an altar. And the man that owned it tried to give it to him. He said, no, I won't do it. It's got a cost. Come on, it's got a cost. He bought it for the cost. And a lot of us, if we don't understand that, we hadn't experienced that. If we don't see it like that, you can think that, oh, why, why, do you, why do you give? That's a waste. No, it's not. It's worship. You just don't see it the way you don't see the value, see the advancement of the gospel. You know, you're sitting in a seat that someone else paid for. You're experiencing the gospel that somebody else paid for. Somebody who honored God with their worship. There's always a cost. Always. But he goes on to say, that uh, <laughs> he was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. This is important when it comes to, to worship. Because chapter 5, he was just anointed and crowned. He was crowned king. And so for him to be wearing his linen ephod means that he had to take off his kingly garments. He had to strip that thing off because David knew that in the presence of the king, there's only one king. And when he stripped off the coat, and when we talk about worship, there's some things that need to be stripped off because it's real easy to identify with and get our identity from, I'm the king, but David because he was a man after God's own heart. He knew that in the presence of the king, that there was only room for one king, and he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he stripped down into his plain white teeth. And there's some things that we need to strip off. Get our identity and our worth and our value from so much stuff that we do. I love the fact that it didn't, didn't tell you what he took off. It just tell you what he had on. And when we come to the foot of the cross, can I tell you, we're all equal. It's all level playing ground. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care if you're a CEO or you're a multimillionaire. You could be Bill Gates in here. Let me just say this. In the presence of the king, all that stuff is stripped away. All that stuff has to come off because there ain't room but for one king. And David knew that. 
Can I tell you, when we step into eternity, when we step into the presence of God Almighty, come on, there's not, there's not, I'm not going to be a pastor. Like, that's maybe what I did on earth, my assignment. I said this first service, there's no loggers and lawyers and pastors and that, there's none of that. When you strip it all down, there's only worshipers. It's only worshipers. And we can bring in stuff that's so heavy and that hinders us. And David said, I got to cast that all off. I'm in, the, I'm in the presence. Oh, I'm just, I'm just like everyone else. When I step into the crowd, when I step into the congregation and I take my place, I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to raise my voice and I'm going to praise God and I'm going to celebrate him for he alone is worthy. I don't want anything that's going to take away from him. He's the main thing. He's the only thing. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. Even the elders in Revelation chapter 4, 24 elders. They're, they're somebody. They've got to be somebody. They fall down before him. What they do, what they do, what they do, what they do. They took the crown because there ain't room but for one crown in the presence of God Almighty. And some of us bring our accolades and bring our accomplishments and bring our titles and bring our bank accounts and bring our self-worth. And I'm telling you, true worship causes you to strip it all off and acknowledge him who is worthy of honor, praise, and glory. Oh, I hope you make room for God's presence and his preference. Oh, I hope you find the rhythm of worship. I hope you strip down any of these things that you may have thought made you something. Come on, because he is the something. Oh, we're going to stand and we're going to worship for just a second because I want to give place and space for God to speak to you concerning this. Come on, stand with me all over this room. We're going to make room for God's presence. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to lift my hands. I don't care if you think it's weird. It's God's will. I will make room for you. I'm going to make room for him.